everyone, thanks for joining me. My name is Lacey Hankin. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Nevada, Reno. Today I'll be sharing some work about the drivers of natural regeneration across different disturbance types and climatic conditions in high elevation five needle pines. I'd like to start out by acknowledging my co-author and PhD advisor, Dr. Sarah Bisping, and our funders, the University of Nevada, Reno, the California Native Plant Society, and the USDA. High elevation five needle pine forests serve a really important role for both ecological and anthropogenic communities. They provide essential ecosystem services, including snowpack stabilization, which is critical for our downstream water supply. Their slow growth and extreme longevity has allowed them to persist through significant climatic changes. But we're in this period of unprecedented change coupled with other stressors which has led to widespread tree mortality and has raised concerns about the future of this important forest type. This forest type in particular occupies areas of climate space that are predicted to significantly decline or disappear in the future, which is shown in this figure from Ackerley and others. We can see two climate scenarios by the end of the century, warm dry and warm wet, where the warmer redder colors are areas of climate space that will increase and the cooler colors are areas of climate space that will disappear or significantly decline in the future. And these are the climatic conditions that characterize our high elevation mountain environments. Changes in climate, particularly warming, are also changing the extent and dynamics of native mountain pine beetle, and high elevation forests have experienced widespread mortality events due to the beetle moving up in elevation, up in latitude, and having greater winter survival. White pines in particular are also susceptible to white pine blister rust, and the Rockies have already seen widespread declines in white bark and limber pine forests due to this non-native pathogen. The pathogen enters leaves through the stomata and then girdles stems and branches, which causes rapid seedling mortality and extensive crown dieback. Lastly, fire is not a dominant structuring agent in these dry high elevation forests because of fuel limitations. But in the wetter portion of the range, changes in fire regimes are also sources of concern for the persistence of these forests. All of these compounding stressors interact, leading to increasing forest vulnerability. So adult tree mortality is coupled with decreasing opportunities for establishment. Long generation times and population isolation further limits potential migratory or adaptive responses to these changes. So there may be an increasingly important role of management and restoration in the future. Given these potential declines and rare opportunities for establishment, we wanted to better understand the regeneration niche of these species and how different disturbances might influence natural regeneration. So we asked how does disturbance interact with climate, particularly water availability, to influence the regenerating community? and how do local site and forest conditions mediate or exacerbate the effects of climate and disturbance. We focused on the dominant high elevation tree species of the Great Basin, which are all five needle pines, including the Great Basin bristlecone pine, uh, whitebark pine, and limber pine. Limber and whitebark pine both rely heavily or completely on bird dispersal, particularly the Clark's nutcracker, while bristlecone pine is both wind and bird dispersed. These species can generally tolerate the harsh conditions of upper tree line environments, but differ some in their physiological tolerances and susceptibility to mortality agents. We sampled 70 sites across Eastern California and Nevada, as shown in the map on the right. And you can see that in this region, tree populations are fairly isolated on mountaintops due to the basin and range topography that characterizes our region. We sampled the overstory and understory communities, characterized site and disturbance conditions, and evaluated climate and soil data at all of our sites. You can see the huge range of variation that we saw for tree regeneration. The figure on the right is showing regeneration density for each species across different disturbance types on the x-axis. One thing to point out is just the order of magnitude difference in whitebark pine regeneration. So you can see on the y-axis, it's not a linear scale. So there's significantly higher whitebark regeneration on the left. And this variability among disturbance types and mountain ranges 
required further analysis to better tease apart the drivers of these patterns for each species. And we would expect highly variable patterns of regeneration because there are so many interacting factors influencing both establishment and then early seedling survival across a heterogeneous landscape. I used a series of species specific mix effect structural equation models rough, um, and so I'll just go through some of those, um, those main results next. And so first to orient you to the figures, each path is associated with an estimated standardized path coefficient. So those are the arrows you're seeing. Red arrows depict a negative effect and black arrows depict a positive effect. The thickness of the arrow corresponds to the magnitude of the effect. So the total effects are the indirect effects plus the direct effects, whereas just the indirect effects are the product of the path coefficients that are indirectly involved. So the ones that don't directly lead to regeneration at the end. For white bark pine, we saw that generally regeneration was highest in, dense, in denser sites with greater snowpack. Climatic effects were also strongly mediated through mature tree density. These patterns are consistent with our understanding of the species preference for cooler moisture conditions compared to our other focal species. Surprisingly, beetle attack did not have much effect on regeneration, uh, which may make sense given the time of sampling since beetle attack and the fact that beetles would not directly affect seedlings themselves. In contrast, limber pine regeneration was driven more by local site conditions, primarily mature tree density, and an indirect positive effect of spring minimum temperature. The primary disturbance at limber pine was fire. However, it didn't have really any apparent effects on regeneration density. The overall low explanatory power of this model is consistent with our understanding of limber pine as a really generalist species that exhibits broad environmental tolerances, as well as potentially high phenotypic plasticity. In contrast to limber pine, bristlecone pine was more sensitive to climatic drivers, primarily through indirect effects on tree density. Tree density had the opposite effect of regeneration than in the other species. And spring minimum temperature and summer maximum temperature had overall positive effects on regeneration through that indirect pathway. Bristlecone pine was also negatively affected by snowpack and shrub cover, which may be due to its position at higher elevations and its poor competitive ability. Regen was higher in fire disturbed sites. However, fire in these sites was often only a few lightning killed trees. So this may speak to the availability of coarse woody debris as nurse objects. Um, and there was also a strong interaction with disturbance and climate at these sites where maximum temperatures had strong negative effects in burn sites, which may be due to the loss of the buffering effects of canopy cover. Our results highlight interesting divergent responses among species, especially to tree density and moisture in various forms. Mature tree density is clearly important, and this effect could speak to the importance of seed availability or the buffering effects of canopy cover for microclimate conditions. We know that bird dispersal is playing a significant role, but our metrics of seed availability were ultimately dropped from our models. Contrasting sensitivity to moisture and temperature suggests that limber and bristlecone pine forests may tolerate future climate conditions better than white bark pine. However, the order of magnitude difference in regeneration with white bark having significantly more may maintain fairly stable forest composition. However, white bark and limber pines will continue to be the most susceptible of the three to our primary mortality agents in this region. So continued monitoring is definitely necessary. Together, these studies can help us better understand how forests will recover following disturbance and persist in the future. Already, we've seen widespread tree mortality and the stability of this important forest type will ultimately depend on natural regeneration. With this study, we can establish baseline conditions of natural regeneration across a heterogeneous region and identify conditions that lead to low natural regeneration, which may be targets for more active management in the future. 
Based on juvenile preferences, we can also begin to predict future forest composition and distribution. While disturbance did not have a strong effect, we have seen widespread tree mortality across the Great Basin in Eastern California, and the loss of canopy cover coupled with changing climate conditions will likely reduce establishment opportunities, requiring continued monitoring. We, we have additional experiments planned to help identify the thresholds for seedling survival and evaluate the adaptive capacity of different populations of these species to expected future conditions. So more resilient populations may be good candidates for seed sources if future planting efforts are needed. Before I end, I'd like to thank my mentors and my lab mates at the University of Nevada, Reno, as well as my collaborators at the Forest Service who were instrumental in this work. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Um, please feel free to reach out with questions or comments. Thank you.